it's a new day, so it's time to start going over our slicer settings. In the previous video, we went through Fusion and how to set up, how to make your light box, how to, different considerations about line widths and different design elements, different ways to join the boxes together, all that kind of good stuff. Um, I got a little bit distracted and decided to make a Deathly Hollows lamp for a different birthday. And the light that we're working on right now, this Helldiver's light, is for yet another birthday. In fact, I think most of the things I make go end up going to birthdays. Um, but what we came up with, we, we made a couple of different things for um, the Helldivers. And in this video, I want to go through... Um, all the design or all the considerations for settings and how to make the best result come out of Bamboo Studio. Uh, you can use Orca if you'd like. It's a perfectly fine piece of software. It's got a lot more options in some places. Um, but I do, because I intend on sharing these, I do all of my work in Studio primarily. Um, I still bounce over to Orca for like access to calibrations and things. So let's go ahead and take a look at what we've got so far. Um, I've organized things. I've got a Fusion folder here, and I've got a couple of uh, files. I've got the base and face, those two exports we made as step files. Um, I've also got some renders and other stuff. Let's go ahead and drag our base over, and we'll work with that one first. The first thing we have to contend with is, is it going to fit? Well, yes, it will, because we checked that earlier in our design. So I'm going to come up here to, they call this the, the gizmo bar, by the way. These are your uh, the different tools you have. They call them gizmos. I'm going to bring up Rotate Unit R to do that. Uh, bring this over so it will fit. Once I've done that, I'm just going to right-click on it and center. Now it's in here. Now, I could have rotated this the other way, and I didn't for a reason. Because if I do this, I'm going to have a part of my design touching the no-no zone. This little area right here that's the... Uh, this white out area, you can't print there. Not on uh, the X1 and P1 series, because that's where the cutting lever is for your uh, for the to engage with the tool head to actually push the filament cutter in. There's like a little arm right there. You can disable that and get the full print bed, but if you do that, you get a single color printer, and I don't want to do that. Uh, so I'm going to rotate this back over in an orientation where it fits. Now, I do have to be careful because I'm going to have a little bit right here from this prime line that will be underneath my print. So I can very quickly pull that off the printer, or in this case, honestly, since this is the base, I could just ignore it. I really don't care. Um, now that we've got this in here, we need to colorize this, and we need to talk about colorizing in settings. Um, first and foremost, calibrate your filaments. Oh my goodness, calibrate your filaments. What do I mean by that? Well, let's come in and look at uh, just any of my filaments. So I've got just a generic eSun filament. This is just baseline settings that eSun provided, their flow ratios, their densities, the price that I paid at one point in time when I bought some. A couple of other things in here I've done, like this one actually has a bad setting. This is a default setting for the aux fan. Your aux fan blows in from the left side of your plate if you have an X1 or P1S. 70% um, aside from being loud will put honestly my opinion too much cooling in here and start to cause overcooling on this face and where you have sharp corners or small or small contact areas it can start to warp up and release I set this to 40% in the actual profiles that I use there's a lot of other things you can use in here that you may come into if you're troubleshooting a, a particularly difficult filament. For the most part, the defaults of not having these turned on is just fine. Um, and then there's other settings as well, some G-code you can mess with. This, my generic, like just baseline, doesn't have any real settings in it. But if I come in and pick, like for example, the red one we're going to use later, now I've got some actual settings in here to work look at. I've got a tuned flow ratio. This is something where I went through and did calibration prints using my red spool of eSun PLA Plus to determine that 984 was the appropriate value for its flow ratio. This changes the rate at which it pushes plastic to reach an expected uh, volume that comes out. Uh, you need to calibrate basically every spool you have. Um, there will be a difference even in the same manufacturer and the uh, the same formula. So like in this case, eSun PLA Plus, 
it will change from color to color. If I look at my warm, it's just a tiny bit higher. My warm white, this is the one I use for all my faces, it's just a tiny bit higher. If I come in and look at my black, where's that one? That one was actually the same, or I just copied the value, probably just copied it. Um, but there will be some small differences, and this number changing just a tiny bit actually makes a pretty big difference in the quality of the print. So definitely for sure you need to calibrate that. If you have an X1 series printer, you can do this automatically. It'll print a little uh, test chip out and scan it with the LiDAR. Usually works pretty well, unless you have a shiny or translucent filament. So sometimes you have to still do the manual calibration. It'll print out a series of test chips. You evaluate which one you like best, you tell it, it prints out another set of chips, you pick the best one from there, and it tells you what your value is. Um, this is also built into Orca. You can do the exact same thing there. There's a great write-up in the Orca documentation as to what to look for, how it works. Absolutely, every spool you have, take the 10 minutes, run the calibration. It takes 30 minutes if you're, if you're doing the manual. Absolutely worth running. The other calibration, and you'll notice there's only two of them that they really list here. There's lots and lots of other calibrations you can run, but the two that matter the most, honestly, for 99% of your filament, are going to be flow rate and pressure advance. Now, in studio, they call this flow dynamics, but everyone else in the world calls it pressure advance. This controls the rate at which it pushes the filament as it accelerates and decelerates uh, in and out of turns, starting and stopping lines, things like that. Not having this properly calibrated, just like the example shows here, can cause significant issues. Um, same thing if you have an X1 series, you can do the auto calibration, it prints a test chip, scans it, and you move on with your life. If you do the manual calibration, there's a couple of different ones, different patterns that it can print, and then you evaluate it with your eyes. Um, again, read the wikis, read the documents, it explains all this in great detail. Where this matters for your pressure advance values, you assign those over here in the device tab. So you find your filament slot, like in this case I've got my AnyCubic High Speed Black PLA assigned to A2, it's in my first AMS in slot 2, and after I've calibrated it, I've saved that result and I have my K factor, this is my pressure advance value. Um, I'll have this, if I come in and look, because I have a lot more for my eSuns, I'll have this for every single color. And when I open up a new spool, I run it again, just to make sure. Um, you will find different values for different materials, different formulas, and different colors. It's like in this case, I've got a 018 for my warm white, and if I look at something like my black, it's going to be 024. This is affected by the pigmentation they use, if it's like the titanium oxide used in white, if it's like an onyx or whatever they're using in black. Different materials print differently, and these calibrations are how you get them to print consistently from one to the next. Absolutely critical that you do this for your filaments. Uh, if you power cycle your printer, these settings no longer are set. You have to come through and set them every time you turn your printer on, every time you change your, your spools out, put a different material in. In Orca, these values are saved to your filament profiles. So if I come back over here and look at a material profile like my eSun Black, in Orca there would be another category, another line here where it says pressure advance. So different places, but same thing. Um, I could go a little bit more detail when it comes to temperatures. Honestly, the default settings based on the material type for the vast majority of your filaments are perfectly fine. In this case, using 224 PLA, perfectly fine. Don't change it between the first layer and your other layers. That's old school thinking. When you were printing on your ender on a glass plate, you needed a little bit of extra temperature on the initial layer. Um, you don't need to do that with modern print plates, with modern printers. In fact, it can actually cause issues, especially when you're working with light boxes, because light boxes are not your typical print. You're very concerned about your initial layer. You're very concerned about like the, the couple of layers after that. You want it to be consistent. Um, don't ever change your plate temperatures. This is something that does not make sense. Again, it made sense when you were working with glass plates or whatever on old printers. You would put more heat on the initial layer and then let it cool down a little bit to a running temperature for the rest of them. The idea of trying to get better layer adhesion on that first layer. If you're using a textured PEI plate or basically anything you can get from bamboo, if it's clean, you're not going to have adhesion issues. 
take it to the sink, wash it off with Dawn dish soap, rinse it really good, give it an IPA wipe, it'll be fine. Uh, some people jack this temperature way up. I don't. The defaults, 55 for a textured plate, have been perfectly fine for everything I've ever thrown at it. Uh, the default temperatures for normal printing speeds are perfectly fine. If you're trying to crank this up and print at 400 millimeters a second, yeah, you're going to have to add some temperature to it. In fact, if I come in and look at my high speed, I'm printing that at 235 instead of 220. I need that extra temperature because I'm intending on pushing this really, really fast. In fact, you can see the, the MVS is 26 cubic millimeters a second. Uh, MVS is a fun metric to mention real quick. That is your overall speed governor for the entire printing process using that filament. And this basically says at any given moment in time, any second, how many cubic millimeters of material can I properly extrude through this printer? Uh, for high speed materials, they generally go higher, like 26. Your generics print at like 21, the, or I'm sorry, the bamboo prints at 21, and your generics are set for like 12, uh, which makes sense. The generic settings are, well, they're generic. You want them to be the lowest common denominator. So you're really cheap, like sun lose or whatever, they might need to be printed slower to print accurately. And you'll see that, like if I come down and find a generic, generic PLA, yeah, 12. Um, you can print faster than this. On almost every single spool I've ever used, you can hit 18, 19 cubic millimeters a second, no problem. Calibration prints, that's something that's inside of Orca. There is a maximum volumetric speed test. So if you want to push it faster, don't use the speed slider. That's absolutely a gimmick. Tune your filament. Do calibration prints, find out what your MVS is, and use that. Uh, where that comes into play, so for example, on this print, um, I'm going to be using that any cubic just because I finally got it dialed in and I'm kind of happy with it. Um, I know it can print fast. Well, how fast? If I use default settings and it wants to print what? I don't know. Um, 200 on the outer walls, 300 on the inner walls. Well, what is 300, milli 300 linear millimeters a second? So as it prints like a, a line, 300 millimeters a second. Well, you have to compute the volume in that as well, and that's honestly not terribly hard. If you look at it and say, I've got a 0 .0 0 0.42 millimeter line that's printing at 0 0.2 millimeters height, that is for my cross section, 0 0.084 millimeters squared. And now I need to add some length to that to give it volume. Uh, or in my case, I can take my maximum volumetric speed and divide this number into it. So if I'm looking at a MVS of 12 cubic millimeters a second, and I divide that by 0 0.084, my cross section, I get 143 millimeters per second linear speed. Okay, neat. So 12, the MVS of 12, doesn't matter what I set my speeds to, I'm capping out at 143. Okay, well, what if I look at that any cubic? I've got 26 is my MVS. Divide that by 0 0.084. I can hit 300 millimeters a second now, 310 almost. Cool. I use on all of my ESUN, which I'm almost done getting rid of, I use 18. I know it can print at 21. It prints nicely at 18. Divide that by 0 0.084, I get 214, 215 millimeters a second. So I could easily, with my ESUN, hit this outer wall speed, but then my inner wall speeds won't really be that much faster. They'll be like 215-ish instead of 200. That's the point of maximum volumetric speed. It, your slicer says, like for outer wall here, print up to this fast if you can, and then it does the math based on the line it's printing to figure out how big that cross section is. It says, oh, well, you're printing a, a line that is, come back over to quality, 0 0.42 millimeters wide, and it's 0.2 millimeters tall. So we know that cross section, that's where that 0 0.084 comes in, figures out the MVS for you. This is one of the cool things about the way all of the Slicer variants like Prusa and Orca and Bamboo Studio, really cool the way they figure this out compared to some of the older slicers like uh, Cure and whatnot, where they just simply say, go this fast. Uh, so if you're coming over from a older style printer or you've been using Creality Slicer or Cura or some of the others, 
where they just simply say, go this fast. This is different. This is not a go this fast. This is a please go this fast if you are able. It's an important thing. Um, I'm not going to go through all of the settings on the defaults because we're not going to use them. But before I go any further than that, I want to go back to materials real quick and talk about your materials up here. I've got two AMS units connected right now. I haven't finished building my new bench to put the other two in. So I have eight materials loaded. My print, however, is going to have three materials in it. I'm going to have black, silver, and my glow-in-the-dark. So I'm going to cut this down to only have three materials in it. And then I'm going to choose the materials I'm going to use. My black, my glow-in-the-dark, and my silver. Where is my silver? It always hides from me. I always miss it. There it is. Since those are the colors I'm using, those are the colors I'm choosing. Why am I doing that? If I leave all of these extra materials mapped in this print job, it can get very confusing when I come back later and need to make changes to it. Uh, what I have listed here is not in the order that they're in my AMS. In fact, I think I have these spread between two AMSs, but that doesn't matter. There's a lot of argument about that. I'm not going to get into it. List off the colors, the materials that you need for your print. Don't leave a whole bunch of extras in here. It's just clutter. And when you come back to make changes, if you're, cha if you're updating something that has been heavily colorized in the past, it will only make your life more difficult. So I just list off the ones that I know I'm going to use. Uh, I encourage you to do the same. As far as coloring our print, well, I imported a step file. And that step file was made of components that had subcomponents. If you remember that from our first video, here's my component base. And then here are those subcomponents that I made inside of it and gave names. I can easily identify either by looking at what it highlights. So like base accent highlights my accent strip or by the name, what these things actually are. When it comes time to color them, well, I want my accent to be made out of glow in the dark. And I want my reflector layer to be made out of silk silver. That's it. I'm done. I've colored this print. There's nothing else that I need to deal with on here as far as changing materials is concerned. Uh, it's just as easy on the face when we get to that. You'll see that part later. So, so far we have covered, I think I mentioned we're using textured PI plate. That's absolutely essential for light boxes to look good. If you're using a smooth plate, the faces look terrible. We've talked about filaments and some of the settings that are important there. Now we're getting into process settings. There's a couple of different sections in your slicer to be familiar with. First of all, this entire time we've been hanging out in the prepare tab. That's where filaments and process settings and all that stuff lives. I've gone over to the device tab a few times to show off the AMS settings and the calibration settings. They have their own uh, tab up here. Inside the prepare tab, this is where all your material specific and setting specific, the process settings live. And what's really cool, when you have filament profiles, like I've got my AnyCubic here, this is its filament profile, its material profile, you can also have process profiles. Use process profiles. Don't try and set every value every time for every print. It's just a waste of time, and you'll miss something and have a bad print. In my case, we're printing the, the base of a light box, and I happen to have a base profile already saved, ready to go. So I'm just going to switch over to that. And this changes so many things. First of all, first of all, come up here, click on file. I'm sorry, the little arrow next to file. Go down to preferences. Turn on developer mode. You want this turned on if you want to see all of the settings, because there are some things that they hide from the default view that a lot of people don't need to mess with. They're advanced settings. But light boxes, for all their simplicity, are actually really advanced prints. You want to have those things open. Since I'm printing the base of a light box, this is more or less a traditional print in the sense that you really don't care what the bottom of it looks like. Print it fast, and that's really all you care about. So in that case, I'm printing everything at 0.28 millimeter height. I'm leaving my initial layer width at 0.5. That initial layer, I come down and look at it. It's the, well, your initial layer, what first prints against the bed. If I look at my print time, i got two hours and two minutes here. 
when I print the face of my box, I'm going to have this down at the minimum width that a 0.4 nozzle can reliably print at, which is 0.32 millimeters. I just added 10 minutes to my print for absolutely no gain. So yeah, for my base, I'm leaving that at its default value so it can print nice and thick and nice and fast. Uh, from there, these I think are all default values. They affect the width of the lines that you're printing. For a base, really doesn't matter, so keep them on your defaults. Z-seam. Hopefully everybody knows what a Z-seam is. If I pull this back up, you'll see, like right here, I've got these white markers. And that's enabled because I have uh, seam views turned on. This is where your print lines start. So when it gets to that layer, this is where it's going to start extruding that material. Uh, somewhere on this one, let's see if we can find it on the outside. Since I have it set to aligned, which I think is a default value, it's going to find a convenient corner to hide the Z seam in. Where is it? Uh, right, there it is. Oh, that's clever. This is what I love about a line. If I come out here and look at the outside of this, see that dot? That's where it's starting my outside. So it found a good corner to cram that seam into so it'll be nice and clean. That's pretty neat. Um, there's some other stuff you can mess with in here like scarf seams. Scarf seams are really cool. Not really something you care about on most of the light boxes you print. It could be if you're printing like a big square maybe or something where it could benefit. What the scarf seams do, um, I don't know if we'll really be able to see it or not on this model. Uh, not doing anything at all on the outside. They're being used on the inside though. Um, it stretches that seam out. It prints really, really thin and then ramps up the height and then alternates that as it goes. It, it kind of blends your seam together. Um, on a lot of prints that can make your Z seam virtually disappear. On this one though, it's on the inside of a light box where I can't really see it. I don't care. I'm leaving it alone. Um, Worth using, worth playing with. I encourage it, but don't need it here. Um, precision. These are all default values. I would point out the resolution as being important. Uh, remember, we imported a step file. A step file is not a mesh. So STL, OBJ, 3MF, they're all mesh files. They have triangles and vertices and, and things like that to put together a, um, a well, mesh of your model. Uh, step files don't do that. Step files are mathematical representations of the shapes themselves. So it will reference like a cylinder here, a circle there, that kind of thing. Uh, but your, your slicer can't understand how a uh, step file works because it's not a mesh and it needs a mesh. When you import a step file, it converts it into a mesh. The resolution, we'll call it, the quality of that mesh is going to be based on your precision resolution settings. Um, for basic comparison, a high quality STL or a high quality 3MF file created in Fusion will give you the very, very similar results, basically the same results as a step file imported with this default value of 0, 1, 2 millimeters. So I like working with step files. I get better curves out of them. Um, with still having small file sizes. It's like where this is a little bit over 600K, uh, an equivalent STL or three, uh, an equivalent STL would probably be three or four megabytes and probably a meg for the 3MF file. Uh, not that it really matters. We're talking about small numbers on huge hard drives, but it adds up. Um, I like step files. I'll just leave it at that. And this setting matters for that. Don't care about ironing. Default is to have it off. I'm leaving it off. Wall generator, I'm leaving on classic. Uh, there are two different wall generators you can work with, classic or arachne. The arachne generator changes the shape and positioning of how it draws its lines for better positioning, better accuracy. We will be using that on the face of our light box, but for the base, I don't care. Classic is actually a better choice. Um, I say that. Let's take a look real quick. Let's challenge myself here. I've got eight and a half minutes of travel time. If I switch this to Arachne, what happens? Something I'd seen earlier, and I'm curious if that goes down or not. Goes up significantly. Why did that happen? 
So what I was, oh, okay, because it adds more. So what I was looking at, if I look at this corner right here, this is now a continuous line. I've got five walls thick, and they're continuous all the way around, thanks to Arachne. When I was looking at it in Classic, I had just coming down and then breaking and then moving and then breaking and then moving. What, and this is, this is part of where it's different. That little break, okay, it's just going to print, skip, and keep printing, fine. If I come down over here to these corners right here, though, it's going to make a sharp turn and then come around. The Arachne engine did not like this. The Arachne engine tried to keep the outer walls uh, more precise, and then it filled it in with this extra little thing in the middle here. That's where all my extra travel time is coming from. So yeah, I'm actually saving a significant amount of time. Uh, printing in Arachne, this is 2 hours, 21 minutes. Printing in Classic, it was, what, 202, I think? Yeah. Um, I'm leaving that in Classic. If I had done this a little bit better, if I'd been a little bit smarter, um, this would be a continuous line all the way across. That would make it stronger, but I do have four continuous lines all the way around, so I'm fine with that. Uh, that's one of those considerations in Fusion about the width of your walls. When I used 1.9 millimeters instead of 2 or 2.1 or 1.8 or whatever, um, trying to make this to where it draws an appropriate width of lines makes a huge difference. Okay, uh, moving on. Wall order. Inner, outer is a default, perfectly fine. I usually use inner, outer, inner for a lot of models that are not light boxes, but for light boxes, it really doesn't matter. Inner, outer, the default is perfectly fine. This is better with overhangs. Outer, inner is better for actual, like, precision uh, geometry, which would matter, but not really in this model. Um, inner, outer, the default, perfectly fine. The rest of this, I believe, is all default, and I'm not messing with any of it, because again, the bases, they're kind of boring. I'm going to go over to strength real quick. Wall loops, three, default, I think. Two, maybe default, I don't know. Three, I leave it at three, three is fine. That's just saying how many put in here, and since my objects here are five thick, let's see what happens if I make that two. Is it going to try and do gap and fill in there instead? It's already doing gap and fill. Yeah, nothing changes. It's in pretty much exactly the same. There's going to be less on the, the lower layers. And I want the extra wall there because it gives me something more to attach things to. Uh, so, surface patterns and such. In your standard, I'm going to go print a thing settings. You have monotonic line for your top surface pattern because this is prettier. You have monotonic, monotonic, I never say that word right, for your bottom surface because it's technically a tiny bit stronger, and it's also the surface you don't care so much because you're not seeing it, not in your standard prints. Uh, I've got my shell layer set to three on both, and I have a zero distance for these. Well, what, what and why is all of that? Uh, as far as the shell layers and the number that it gives you, where you can specify a height, let's look at that. So this red one is my top surface for the inside of my print. If I count down, I've got one, two, three layers, and then we see infill. That's what I've got here. I've got my three layers and my infill. If I give that a value, like one millimeter thick, it's now going to evaluate first how thick is this top surface, and then is this enough top shell layers to reach that thickness? Well, in this case, it's not. It's going to add a fourth layer here. So if I double check it from here, there's my infill. One, two, three, and top surface makes four. The thickness measurement will override the number of layers. Does this matter for a light box? No, I want the control. I'm setting it to zero. If you're printing a more organic model or if you're printing something that has... Uh, lots of round curved surfaces or anything you've used variable heights on, absolutely make sure you set these thickness values. But again, light boxes in many ways are very boring. We don't need those. As far as the differences between monotonic and monotonic line, and I know somebody out there is raging at their keyboard because I can't say those words correctly. Let me zoom way in on this corner here. Oh my goodness, I should have angled it before I zoomed in. There we go. You can see my top shell, or top surface pattern being monotonic line. It draws a line, where the name comes from. 
then it rotates back and goes up for the next one. Comes back down, stops that line, starts a new line. This lets you put closer in detail. And by that, if I compare my top surface using monotonic line to my bottom surface using just monotonic, scroll down to look at my bottom surface, you can absolutely see the difference here. It tries to make a continuous line by bending and wrapping as it goes around. It's fine for speed. I think it's actually just fractionally marginally faster. It's supposed to be stronger because it's a continuous line instead of multiple broken lines. Uh, the way we print them, it really doesn't matter. For this being the base, this is perfectly acceptable. On our face, when we care about what the bottom of the print looks like, I actually flip this around. I invert it. Uh, we'll talk about that more in the face. You'll notice that I have the... Uh, where is it? I think it's actually under quality. Yeah, under quality, I have the check mark for only one wall on first layer. That gives me one outer wall, and then it starts attaching this, uh, this surface to it. Why do I do that? Well, you see these little gaps right here. Those are ugly, now, even though we're not having light coming through here. But when I come up to my next layer, now my walls cover that up. That little bit of difference between them ensures that I have a nice, good, strong bond. At the same time, if any of these little pieces did not properly adhere to this one wall, now there's something literally on top of them holding them down. Uh, it's, I do this for everything. I would encourage doing the same for yourself. Uh, and like I said, for the face, we're going to do it actually in the complete opposite. Because having layer confusion, having it work, uh, having each layer being slightly different means you get better coverage and no pinholes. Uh, sparse infill density, I, I, can, I use aligned rectilinear at 20%, and yes, there is infill in this. If I come up to my fourth layer, those red lines, that's my infill. I could print this solid. There's no reason why not if you want to, other than it's just wasting time and material. Uh, aligning this is going to be important. So working our way down the settings, uh, I leave these all at default. Um, I crank this up from, I think, 15 is the default to 20. That's just controlling the amount. I zoom, oops, I zoom way in here. That's controlling the amount of overlap where this red line touches this yellow line. How much does it squish into that to try and bond those together? 20% for me has been a nice, safe value. Uh, as far as direction, this is something you have to change, and actually something they just changed, I think, in 191 or 193. I'm currently using 1935. Yeah, this is a very recent change. So I need to amend some things I've said before. It used to be, if I come up to where I get this blue layer, this blue layer technically says it's a bridge. I call it a bridging layer, even though it's not 100% accurate. This is my first top surface layer. Uh, you want this to be as perpendicular as possible to this. If these blue lines are perpendicular to these red lines, you will have a very clean surface. Because there's very, very, very short bridges between them. Aligned rectilinear, it prints a single continuous line with no... Uh, no intersections. Like if I switch this over to grid, the horrible evil grid, as it prints grid, these lines cross each other. They literally smush and crash into each other and causes all sorts of havoc and ugly and bad. The line rectilinear is faster than gyroid. It's not intersecting like gyroid and it's even. For a flat thing with a little bit of infill, absolutely the best perfect infill my opinion orienting it however has always been fun and this has been a value that has to be changed on every single print if i look up one layer at my first top surface but again i call my bridge layer it used to be that the angle this was set at was determined 100 percent entirely by the shape of your model you could not impact it you think oh well, i've got this bridge direction down here i can change this to 45 degrees and it's going to change the angle it prints at and it doesn't even still that does not affect it it's still printing that in the same orientation 
In previous versions, you could also change your infill direction and it would have no impact on which way that bridging layer printed, but that has changed. As of 19, or 1935, 1395, whatever version we're on now, um, there it's smarter, it's more intelligent how it tries to bond these together. So if we look at it real carefully, I've kind of got it kind of got it squared up here. I've got this line going at what I don't know, what is that? Maybe like 45 degrees. If we started our origin down in the bottom left, draw up, maybe that's like 55, something like that. If I put this to its default 45 degrees, what this is what this is changing, what this is adjusting, if I go down and look at my very first layer, it's the angle at which these lines are drawn. And then all subsequent lines, depending on your patterns from there, will print in their own ways. Um, in this case, if I print this at 45 degrees this way, and this is something new, now my bridging layer has changed orientation as well. That's super cool. It used to not do that. So now I can set my first layer to 45, which I'm perfectly happy with. It gives me a lot of good, clean surface contact with a lot of these walls. I'll get my three bottom layers, which are using, by the way, my internal solid infill pattern. Every single thing I print, bar none, is always monotonic line. I have no reason to use any other internal solid infill pattern. Reason being, it's, uh, well, it's a whole separate video. I've done one on it. Oh, I'll just link it here and save you the time here. It makes for cleaner prints. I'll just say that. Um, now that I've got my infill going at that 45 degree angle, and now I've got my uh, my first top surface bridge layer coming down at a perpendicular angle, which is fantastic. That's really, really cool. This has just made life much easier. That the This angle is much more intelligent than it used to be. Uh, that's super awesome. I love it. So basically, what I'm looking at when I look at this, I'm going to go down to that blue layer and compare it against my infill. Just make sure they're perpendicular. Tweak this infill direction angle as necessary to ensure that you get perpendicular lines between your infill and your first top surface layer. Uh, it will change based on your model, how clean that looks, how clean that works. Just double check it. This is important because, uh, well, I've got a few other settings here. It's important because of speed, and I'll show you that in a second. Uh, infill combination I have turned on. Uh, you can turn it on or off if you want. I have it on just because I can. Uh, it works fine with PLAs. Basically, that says print your infill as thick as it possibly can, just to save you some time. I have detect narrow, in, so, narrow internal solid infill turned off. We're not going to see that on this model, but we'll see that on the face. That's referring to areas that have small internal dimensions if it's going to make them concentric patterns or use whatever layer pattern you have defined. It, for the faces, absolutely that has to be off. For the base, it really doesn't matter. Uh, vertical shell thickness is an important one. That will adjust the final height of the model. Uh, I think what they say is that the, the last couple layers will be adjusted so that you actually get to exactly the height you've defined. Um, Looks like it's actually not doing that because I've got an extra 0.8 millimeters on there. Interesting. Anyways, um, I mentioned the speed settings and why this matters. Um, we could do a lot more with calculating maximum volumetric speed and how fast things print and blah, blah, blah. But basically, the bridge setting, where is it? The bridge speed, I think by default, is like 50 or 70 millimeters a second. It's not very fast, and that makes sense. You're printing over air. You're printing basically tiny bridges. But since we know that we have nice perpendicular lines here, I'm going to print it nice and fast. This alone will save several, you know, probably another 10 or 15 minutes. Uh, I'm going to go back and look just real quick, see what the default is. What is the 20 millimeter standard bridge? Uh, yeah, save that for now. 50 millimeters a second. Okay, so we'll go back to my base. We'll slice it. We're at two minutes and two, or two hours even for the oops, not layer height one. We're at two hours even for printing this model. If I turn this back to its 50 millimeter setting, we just added 10 minutes for nothing, for absolutely no gain, because we're going to get a clean result at 150. 
So yeah, I'm going to speed that up because I've made the intelligent choice to make sure that my infill and my bridge layer are perpendicular. Cool beans. Um, I'm actually going to reabsorb that time somewhere else. It's basically it for the speed tab. Um, travel acceleration or printer specific if you have like an X1 versus an A1 or whatever. I don't mess with those. There's no reason to change those. Supports, I leave them on manual. It's completely unnecessary, but I do it anyways. I'm going to come in and I'm going to put a support over my USB-C hole right here. So I'm going to select my model, go to support painting. I'm going to choose the fill tool on overhangs only and drag this up to like 30 something. Doesn't really matter. I'm going to find that spot where I have an overhang for my USB port. Click it. That's it. I'm done. That's the only spot that needs support on this entire thing. And it's going to add a, a couple minutes, one minute, to throw in a little bitty bit of support right underneath where my USB plug goes in. Is that absolutely necessary? No, it really isn't, but I do it anyways. Uh, it adds a minute and a fractional gram of material to ensure that I have a clean result underneath here. Settings that I have in there for that, I have very small branch diameters. Usually this is like five millimeters. I cut it down to one and that just ensures that I actually have more little branches inside of it. Uh, wall support loops at two, just make sure that these actually have uh, some thickness to them so they're more stable. My top Z distance, I've got it 0.16. It's going to be close enough to touch, but not close enough to bond. Uh, I think the default is 0.2. Uh, there may be some other settings in here. I think these are all pretty much default. Uh, maybe the top interface layers. If you're using a, um, a support material, like if you're using PETG for this or the breakaway support or whatever, these values all change dramatically, but not in the scope of this video. Uh, yeah, that's basically it. Now for the base of our model here, you'll notice there's no prime tower, even though I'm doing um, color swaps. Because for the base, I have absolutely no reason to maintain a prime tower. If there's a little bit of material going from black to silver or black to glow in the dark, where for a couple of millimeters on one of those lines, it's not clean, it doesn't matter. It's perfectly fine. So no skirt, no brim, no prime tower, regular default settings basically across the board underneath the others tab. When we start to look at our face, these things change. But for the base, again, the idea is speed. So we're not doing that. Um, I think that's everything. Yeah, I think that's just about everything. Um, the bases are very boring. There's not a lot to really go over. Um, there's a couple things that I'm going to do specifically to this model, though. So going back to prepare, I'm, I'm leaving most of my settings global. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned this earlier. There are some settings that you can have that are global values and some that are object specific. As an example, I've got initial layer and support and I think default are some options that I have here underneath my global settings. But if I go to object and look specifically at this object as a whole or one of its sub objects, really doesn't matter which one, I don't have all the same options like for my uh, parent object, I don't have initial layer anymore. If I look at my sub objects, I lose even more options. Because I use different global values for my bases and my faces, I have two different print profiles and I save two different 3MFs, uh, two different studio project files, just to accommodate some of those different global values. The indifference is you have to open up a second file, but you get better prints. Um, in this case, I don't usually change very much for, uh, well, really anything. I want my glow-in-the-dark band to look nice. I need that to print slowly. So I'm going to come into the speed tab on this. It's entirely made out of walls. I'm going to turn those down to like, I don't know, 75. 75 is probably fine. I'm just going to turn all these values to 75. Um, no, no, I'm going to do that slower. Usually I use like 50. 
So I'll do 50 on this one. Um, there's different ways you can do this. By setting those values here, regardless of what material you use, regardless if you're maybe just double assigning this, this is going to be black. I'm going to make, I'm going to print this out of the same stuff as the rest of it. I don't want that band. Well, now it's still printing slowly. I don't like doing this because it's less dynamic. If somebody wants to come in and print this and not do that uh, accent layer, well, I've just added how much time? We were at like two hours. I've just added like 20 minutes, I think. Let's validate that real quick. No, I've added a lot of time. From an hour 48, if... Oh, that's because I made it the black material. Um, yeah, so if I'm printing it entirely out of the black material, it's an hour 48. If I switch this over to my slower glow-in-the-dark that has a lower maximum volumetric speed, that's where the two hours, one minute was, yeah. And if I take this and slow it down in my process settings by saying this component must print slower, I'm going to add even more time to it. A more dynamic way of doing that would be saying that I have a filament profile that prints even slower. So when I go to print that slow filament, it will print slow. And the idea here is that slower, the slower you print things that are translucent, the more clear they are. And I want this to be fairly clear. How do I want to do this one? Do I want to make a slow one? Yeah, I'll make a slow one. Why not? I should do that. So I'm going to come in here and make this like four. And I'm going to call this slow. An MVS of four. Four divided by zero point. Oh, hang on, hang on. These are 0 0.28 millimeter layers printing 0 0.42 wide. So 1176. Four millimeters, four cubic millimeters a second divided by 0 0.1176. 34. That's a bit too slow. What if I made that five? Five divided by 0 0.1176. 42. We're getting better. How about six? Perfect, there we go. So I'm going to set this to 6. So this is my slow preset material. And if I change this to now use my slow material instead, without having my speed values turned down, I'm still slowing down that part of my print. So I will get nice clean walls. And if you decide to print this and you print this with an opaque material that prints fast, it won't slow it down for you. Everybody wins. One thing I am going to force, however, is on my base reflector, this silver layer right here. Well, slow things are shiny, right? So I'm going to say my top surface here is going to be slow. And this is going to add time. This is going to add a lot of time. Uh, but I want that very top surface on this silver to be nice and uh, nice and shiny. And what that's going to do, the reason why we designed it the way we did back in Fusion, now that I have the color mode turned on, you can see where we've got some infill lines there. There's that bridging layer. Now it's going to go to silver. I've got one layer of silver, two layers of silver. And that's it. It's going to go back to black. So I've got, it says four filament changes. It's the first one is loading it with the black, changing it to silver. I'm sorry, it's the um, changing it to silver, changing it back to black right here. Then it's going to be changing it to the glow in the dark right here and then changing it back to black here. OK, one thing I am going to do, one more thing I need to change real quick as I thought about it. Uh, if I look carefully here, I've got everything printing at 0.28 millimeter height. I need to make my lip, this little piece up here at the top, this part, I need to print that at, where is it? Oh, I can't do independent height on subcomponents. So we're going to do something else. We're going to do a height range modifier. I need this to print at point, uh, 0 0.2 millimeters tall so that the little bits inside of here print accurately for the face to mate against. I'm going to come over into my preview. I'm going to scroll down to this part where I can see the top of my glow in the dark is at 35 millimeters. So 35 millimeters to 38 millimeters. 
print height 0 0.20. Now when I slice this, I sort it by layer height. When it switches back over to my black filament, that black filament will print at a thinner layer height. Instead of 0.28 millimeters, it will print at 0.2 millimeters. And I'm doing all of that just to make this little overhang right here print nice and clean and to ensure that this has a matching geometry for the face when we clamp it together. So I want those to be identical. So with that, the base is ready to print. Everything's set up right, everything's good. I've got the reflector layer set to do its top surface slow. I've got a range modifier that tells the very top part to print nice and, uh, nice and thin on the layer height so that the geometry of that matches up to the face. I've got my three materials assigned, and I'm using just all the things that are in my base profile. Uh, if I'm not sitting here explaining this, I load my object in, I click on base, I flip over to strength, and I check my infill orientation. I make that change, and I use my slow filament, and that's it. Nice and quick and snappy. So I'm going to go ahead and pause this video here and have some dinner, and then we'll set up the face in a separate file, and we'll get to printing. Now, real quick before I forget, when we go to print, which I'm going to go ahead and start right now, I mentioned the only using the filaments that you need. Here's why. I can very easily come in here and choose the filaments that I need that match up with the things I want to print. This is where you actually assign the materials you've chosen over here to what matches on your printer. If I had a whole bunch of extra materials listed here, it wouldn't matter because I wouldn't see them here because I'm only using these three materials in my print and I only have to map those to their appropriate slots here. If I were to have a fourth color, there'd be a fourth one here, so on and so forth. Having the extra materials listed in your actual material uh, or your filament choices, it just adds to confusion when you are uh, doing your coloring. So just don't, don't do that. All right, I'm gonna print this out. And after dinner, we'll come back and do the face of our print. All right, so it's a little bit later. Our base has finished printing, and man, what a good-looking base this is. If I had downloaded this off of Maker World, I'd give it five stars. <laughs> but that's done, so one of the kids is in bed at least, and it's time to set up the face of our print. So let's go back over to that. We'd set up our base. We'd printed this. I actually never saved it. I meant to do that. And I'll point out real quick, I had a setting wrong um, I had these two numbers transposed. That was my mistake from something I had been doing before. It didn't actually affect anything in this print, but I've corrected it here and now. So let's go ahead and save this. Helldivers, this is Helldivers base. And we need to make a new one. So new project. Now, same as before, I'm going to take our step file and drag it over. I'm going to do all the same things I did before. I'm going to, well, first, I'm going to flip it over. So right now, it's facing upright. It's hard to see because of the fact that it's all black, but you've got a big hollow void in here. If I were to try and slice this, it would not be pretty. So I'm going to use Lay on Face. Now you can use Rotate if you want, but Lay on Face makes life easy. Click the big surface here. Now it's upside down. Same thing as before, I'm now going to rotate it, and I'm going to center it. So, actually this is great because I won't even have to worry about the prime line down here. We're going to color it. Um, on this one, for our colors, I'm going to need black, white, and red. So where I have my glow in the dark, I'm going to change that to my red. Which, if I choose this one, it's going to work off of just the default profile, which isn't really set up. This is what's listed in my AMS. I'll scroll down and find my actual custom settings for it. My red. And then my warm white. If I go back over to objects, look here. I got a black, a white, and a red. So the same as before. I change these as necessary. And bam, I'm done coloring. No painting tool, 
no changing STLs or whatever. Just six clicks and that's a painted model. Awesome. Now I still have for my filament or for my process profiles, I still have my base selected. And if I try and slice that, it's going to look really dumb. Uh, there's going to be a lot of problems with this. First of all, my face is probably only going to be too thick. Yeah, it's only two layers thick. That'll look terrible. Because I'm using the default 0.5 millimeter line width, you're going to have these gigantic pinholes all over the place. Uh, that will not look good. So there's a couple things you can do to fix that. And what I'm going to do is just switch over to my face profile. Face. We've gone over a lot of these settings in the base video. Uh, oop, I need to grab my prime tower and actually it's fine where it is. I'll ignore that warning. It's not too close. It'll slice fine. Yeah. Um, it's warning me about the prime tower because the box that this draws takes up the whole bed and my prime tower is inside that box. It's not actually looking for collisions. It's just seeing that the prime tower is inside the box. Uh, anyways, so looking at the settings we have here, I'm going to print this entire thing at 0.2 millimeter height. That's fine. It's small. All of the time in this is comprised mainly of the first layer and the filament swaps, uh, which that's the fun thing. Our base, how long did our base take to print? Let's pull that back up. It was two hours and 40 something minutes. Uh, slowed down a lot because I was using the slow profile or that glow in the dark strip. Let me switch back over to that real quick. This strip right here it looks kind of opaque at the moment. Uh, it's a semi-translucent glow in the dark. If I take like my phone here, I guess. Turn the flashlight on. So it'll shine through that pretty well. And of course my office is lit up right now, so you won't be able to see it, but a little bit. It's going to glow. Now, that glow in the dark, turn this off, that glow in the dark likes to work with a higher wavelength light. And by that I mean the higher number wavelength, the smaller uh, wavelength technically, um, ultraviolet, purples, blues, those will do a good job charging these. Uh, full spectrum white, like you get out of cob LEDs, will do a good job charging them. If you are working with uh, RGB LEDs, like you know, a lot of these lights will do, uh, you're not going to get a good charge out of them. The white that they make is not very white. Uh, there's a lot of red in that that doesn't really do it any favors for charging. Adding UV LEDs will make it glow like the freaking sun. Um, but in this case, for this box in particular, having discussed it with the person who commissioned it, I'm going to put a D1 Mini in here, and then I also have my standoffs right here for a PWM driver. So I'm going to put cob LEDs inside of this one, uh, kind of like the same as what's in my printer along the, the top of the spacer. Um, they're going to be high-intensity cob LEDs that are just white. And part of that is whenever I make a box that has um, a color on the face, Using color changing lights makes it look really weird. I don't like the way that, like, um, if I go back to, let's go here. If I go back to the face on this, I've got this big chunk of red on here. If this light changes to red, then the whole thing will turn red because the white will transmit the red and the red will just stay red. But then other colors will make it look just weird. Um, so, yeah, that's not something that I necessarily want it to do. And so for a lot of these, I will switch over to using just white cob LEDs. Um, I think the like the 4000 Kelvin, the natural light or a slightly warmer, like 3200 Kelvin. It's pleasing to the eye. It does a good job, like with charging the um, glow in the dark bits if you're using that. And it also backlights all of the colored plastic very cleanly and evenly. For me, I think it's a great way to go. That said, I mean, I obviously do a lot with the RGB LEDs, like the thing behind me and several others. Um, they're a lot easier to work with because when you go to connect them, you just have one data pin that you connect to your um, D1 Mini. You don't have to deal with drivers and things like that to, to run them. But 
I'm off topic. Sorry, I do that. Let's go ahead and go back to this. Uh, we were looking at the time for our base. That took like two hours and 40, two hours and 45 minutes total time button to finish. Okay. If I look at this one, it's going to be kind of close, I think. Well, almost an hour and 33. And that's for not much plastic. I mean, there's a grand total of 29 grams going into this versus 117 going into the base. That's because of all the color swaps. Color swaps add time. It's because of the fact that there's a very thin first layer. My layer width, my line width on that first layer is 0.32. That's very narrow. That's very thin. So like I'd shown in the uh, when slicing the base up, the more narrow lines, especially on the slower initial layer, lead to longer print times. Uh, but for the face, this is the part we're looking at. This is the part we care about. That's okay. So what I'm looking at here, uh, we'll kind of go through the settings and see what they do for this. Uh, let me go down to the initial layer all the way down to the bottom. I'm using on this one instead of the monotonic or monotonic, however you say it, you see we're monotonic even at 0.32 on round things leaves a lot of these gaps open. It leaves a lot of spaces where it has trouble filling in. Switching that to monotonic line, because it's not trying to put those bends in them. It can pack them in much tighter. And that goes a long way to making sure you don't get pinholes. Uh, beyond that, I'm still using only one line on first layer. Uh, so back underneath quality at the very bottom. Um, only one wall on the first layer means that just like I'd shown before, let me zoom like way in at one little example. Like right here, I've got these little spots where these would not be pinholes. They're too small, but it's a good example that these lines are not going to really dig into the walls. And even if I had multiple walls here, let me turn that setting off, slice it again. It's going to be the same thing. You might pack a little bit tighter in, but not that much more. So what I do... I leave only one wall on first layer, and that way when it goes up to the second layer, you get a, a nice continuous line covering up anywhere that you don't have really good coverage here on that first line, on that first layer. So if I just kind of bounce back and forth a few times, you can see where whatever holes might exist are going to get covered up nicely. The idea that I work with on this is, I call it layer confusion. I, I, it's just a word I came up with on it, that from one layer to the next, if I switch over to single layer view, you have something different on every layer. So as I scroll through one, two, and three here, it, it's a different pattern on every line or on every layer. That helps to ensure that on you know whatever random coordinate you pick, like right here, this one spot, as I scroll through those layers, something will cover that up, hopefully more than once. So yeah, just different settings on all three layers make that, in my opinion, a lot cleaner. Uh, that again is only one wall on first layer. And as a part of that, I don't think there's anything small enough. Maybe the nose. Let's find out. Um, underneath strength, you have this setting for detect narrow internal solid infill. What that does is it looks at the surface area of this component, and if it's under a certain size, it makes it concentric, which this is just big enough to not trip that. I don't think there's anything in this print that would do that. Um, but what that does, if you have that turned on, if this were small enough, instead of being lines back and forth, it would be a concentric pattern. And to show what that would look like, let me switch this over to concentric and go up to here. Concentric lines leave holes everywhere. It, it's Unless you're printing a perfect circle or a perfect rectangle with no obstructions in it, you get gaps all over the place when you use concentric patterns. I mean, just everywhere. So it's my goal to avoid those concentric patterns any way I can. And detect, internal, detect narrow internal solid infill is one of those settings that creates concentric lines so i turn it off um so we'll go through them real quick as kind of the highlight um basically default settings with the exception of initial layer being um pretty much as small as you can get with a 0.4 nozzle 
um, 80%. So you can shrink it by 20% or increase it by 20%. That's, that's basically the rule. You can, from 0.4, you can subtract 20%, which is 0 0.08. So you can get down to 0.32. Or you can add to it to make it a little bit more. Yeah, so more narrow line width. That helps. Uh, and I only do that on the first layer because once you get that first layer down clean and you start to cover up pinholes on the rest of them, there's no reason to make this so incredibly slow as well. Uh, it will cover itself up nicely. From there, scrolling down, uh, seams I leave completely default. There's no reason to change anything there. Precision, leave it completely default. Nothing to change there. We don't use ironing. Uh, wall generator. We switched over to Arachne and I changed the default value up to a 30% transition angle. What that does for you with the Arachne wall engine, if you look at a, a spot like this one, where it's it's coming to a sharp point. Uh, you know, we'll look at the second layer because that'll probably illustrate it better with the multiple walls. Because this again affects your walls. It's your wall generator. If I look at this underneath classic, it's going to have these big open spots in the end because classic says I'm drawing a line with this width and that's what I'm doing. I'll fit it in where I can. Arachne on the other hand says I will adjust the size of that line to make it fit the mesh better. So it's going to kind of wiggle them around and squish them in. Arachne is more concerned about following the mesh more precisely from a coverage perspective is one way you could say it. Whereas a where um, classic is more concerned about perfect geometry instead. That's the way I understand it. That may not be a hundred percent totally accurate, but it, it's what I've understood it. Um, you can see it if you look at like line widths and whatnot. It it helps to fill gaps and close corners. Um, basically, my rule is if it's something that is a structural piece, like uh, like a box or something, that I'm just like printing a storage box i'll use classic if it's something that's more or less artistic then i'll worry about using arachne um, i flip back and forth between them just kind of depending on what i'm printing and it causes a lot of issues for folks whenever the default changes is the way your profiles work the actual profile file itself contains what is different from whatever you started with. So if I started with the 0.2 millimeter height uh, standard default, and I change one thing and then save that as a new profile, that profile is only going to contain my parent object is the default, and this is the one thing that's different. Uh, which means when that parent object, when that default changes, well, your new profile will take that change as well. Uh, so something to be careful with if you're going back to a very old design uh, if something has changed in the slicer double check just to make sure the things you expect are in there uh, just something to watch out for now once you've changed it and saved it it will stay that way once you've made that a a custom setting it will write that into your your profile but if it's something you've never even touched it could change um, inner outer wall order uh, same as default. I mean, all this is default until you get down to initial layer flow ratio. What this is doing on the very first layer, uh, I, I want to keep things as clean as possible. And I mentioned earlier that calibrations, the flow ratio and the pressure advance settings, they matter. But on the first layer, I want to try and get a little bit of extra squish. I want to try and close those pinholes up by having just a tiny bit extra in there. Uh, this does not mean I'm using a flow ratio of 1.04. This means I'm using a multiplier against my flow ratio of 1.04. So an example, we'll look at my white real quick. My flow ratio is 986. Okay. If I were printing this and I had my initial flow ratio set to 1, which we'll go ahead and do. I come down here and I look at, let's find a piece that's white. And let's look at flow. Of course, I have to switch back over there. You. So it has computed for this area, and it's not showing me the actual flow. I could do the math off of the, the rate here. I'm not going to get the calculator out for it. But this is going to be 986, basically. That, that's what it's going to come out to. That's what this extrusion rate would come out to. 
uh, just for, why is it not, I think I have to be at the start of a line for it to show it. There we go. So this one's doing flow of 273. That's its computed flow rate for this line. Um, I'm at 10497 and it's 273. If I change this to be 1.04, or you know what, I'm going to cheat. Oops, that doesn't help. Go away and set that back. I'm going to cheat a little bit for comparing this, just to show the difference. It's so 10497. Let me grab a snip of that and tuck this away for now. We'll change this to 1.04. Slice it again. And it was, oh, let me switch to flow. 1497, come on, where's 97? So if we compare those, I've got a flow of 273 versus a flow of 284. So when I've increased my initial layer by that, 0.04, it's adding 4% to it. And the math on that, if I were to take the 0 0.986, multiply it by 1.04, that's what that's doing, that's where that extra flow ratio comes in. Uh, that tiny bit extra. And I've used one everything from 1.08 to 1.02. Uh, we did piles and piles of tests. I personally am happiest with 1.04. It's just that tiny bit extra that gives you a little bit more on the first layer without causing it to add too much more to the subsequent layers. Uh, so, yeah, I would highly encourage making sure that your material profiles are properly tuned. So whatever they get uh, assigned at, uh, the in this case the red 984 or the white which was 986 which, whatever they come out with with their calibrations where you're happy where they print clean for a light box specifically give it that little extra four percent on the initial layer uh, rest of this I, I leave pretty much as is top surfaces for only one wall on top surface again that's part of that layer confusion that if i come up and look at my third layer the way that blocks together versus the layer beneath it it just makes sure that like if i look right here these corners for these lines are going to have solid walls underneath them so it's just less chance of pinholes uh, that's for first layer and for top layer that i do that so i kind of have like a sandwich of extra walls in the middle um, overhang walls and avoid crossing don't really matter the avoid crossing i need to play with a little bit I haven't noticed a difference with it on or off trying to present or prevent wispies. I want to say it looked like it might have generated a little bit more with the setting on because it puts more travel into the move or into the movement of the printer. And I'm not so much worried about it striking the outside of the print as I am it dragging the nozzle over the print. Uh, so yeah, I just, for the moment, I've been leaving that off. Strength, like I mentioned before, we kind of flip-flop this. The default settings, most of the time, the things that people print, you look at the top of it, not the bottom of it. Well, since we're concerned about the bottom, I have monotonic, monotonic, bleh, I can't say that word. I have that set for my top pattern just for the difference, and monotonic line for the first layers. Um, I can do monotonic line for both of them. There's no reason why not, other than I just want to do something different. Um, I've seen some people will come in and use um, the, was it the Diffie-Hellman, or the Diffie-Hellman, thinking encryption, uh, Hilbert curve, which you can do. That creates a much slower pattern, but it's a much more, uh, what's the right word for it, intense, I'm going to say, where it draws these little boxes everywhere. Um, it does a pretty good job, it really does, but man is it slow. Uh, an hour 20 print time versus... I'm sorry, two hours and 20 versus an hour 26. Yeah. So Hilbert curve what was that? It said two hours and 23, was it? Come on, slice. It's also very slow to slice. Two hours, 20 minutes versus an hour and 20 something. So yeah, it adds an entire hour to that first layer. Not worth it to me. Uh, plus, it, it's not a guaranteed absolute fix of things. 
Um, I have a couple of different settings with the thickness of things. Uh, mainly, I do have the top shell thickness and additional top layers defined. Uh, that's really just to kind of enforce the way the patterns get drawn, but it doesn't really affect anything. Uh, probably just to carry over from something else. If you were printing a much thicker face, like a millimeter thick or 1.2 millimeters thick, these settings would start to matter, but I do everything at 0.6, so I'm not worried about it. Um, infill really doesn't matter. There probably is just only like the tiniest little bit of infill in here. What do we have? Uh, line type... 44 seconds worth of infill. It's probably, yeah, like right here in the, in the very bottom of it. Yeah, I'm not worried about that. There's nothing to worry about with that infill. It's literally just in the, the one little space between our walls. Uh, it doesn't matter. It could be anything. Just I use non-intersecting. I use a line direct linear. This is literally just carryover from the base settings. Um, I mentioned the detect narrow solid infill before. We'll leave that alone. Infill combination doesn't matter because there really isn't any to have. Speeds uh, basically defaults across the board, uh, literally just carryovers from the base profile where the bridge, see, bridge speed is high, but there's literally no bridges in this, so it doesn't matter. Um, speed, acceleration are all just defaults. For supports, I leave them on because they're manual, which means they won't do anything because I haven't painted anywhere. Um, none of this matters because we don't have any supports. As far as others are concerned, no brim. There's no reason for it, especially considering I chamfer my edges on almost all of my boxes. So if I come down and look at the first layer, you watch it slowly grows out. Uh, maybe it's easier to see if I'm looking straight down at it. That it grows out as it goes up. The first like five layers, it's coming up. It gives it a, an almost rounded edge. Putting a brim around that would be an absolute nightmare to clean off, so no brim. Prime tower I leave turned on. Uh, no special mode settings, anything like that. Really, for faces, just to kind of recap it for the five mile overview. Thinner first, la thinner first layer. Bleh. Thinner line on the first layer for details. Arachne at a 30, 30, 30 degree transition angle. Initial layer flow ratio of 1.04, one wall on top and first layers. Strength, flip your default patterns, monotonic on the top, monotonic line on the bottom. Of course, I use monotonic uh, for all, or monotonic line for all of my infill, my internal solid infill. Infill doesn't really matter. I keep the same 20% wall overlap. Um, and make sure you turn off detect narrow internal solid infill. That's really it. You have those settings, you will have a clean face. So I'm going to go ahead and print this one, much the same as before. I'm just going to make sure that my mapping is correct. And it is, it guessed correctly this time, which it doesn't commonly do. Uh, black to black, red to red, white to white, we're good. And I'd want to be careful like it doesn't select the wrong white if I had multiple whites in here. But I know that my warm white is in A1. And I can't select my PETG because that wouldn't work, so it doesn't even let me. Great. Um, I will mention, leave the bed leveling turned on. It adds like a minute to your print, and it helps ensure that it comes out clean. So just leave it on. A lot of people turn it off and then complain when they have issues. It, I'd rather spend a minute now versus another hour and a half printing this over again. So we'll get this one sent off to the printer. And I will go set up my desk so we can start working on putting together the electronics in our base. Um, maybe I'll do the WLED bit first. I don't know. We'll figure that out.